It's all yours, Jason. <laughs> In just a few minutes, we'll get to the final reading of the day. If you want to look it up now, this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'll be beginning in verse 14. Uh, what I want to share with you first, however, is a reading from a somewhat fictional, somewhat fabricated journal entry from 15 years ago. Again, much of this is fictional. It is the year of our Lord, 2008, the 21st of September. This morning, I preached the homecoming sermon at the church. Tradition has held that one of Minokin's former pastors or a guest speaker usually preaches on this day, but because I have been here less than two months, we had all agreed that I would suffice this year. Having lived among these Manukanites of the Northern Neck as a cultural anthropologist for just about eight weeks now, I've made some observations. I've discovered that there are primarily two different tribes in this place, each having its own subspecies. There are the from here's. This is the tribe whose family goes way back to this region, perhaps for generations. They've lived here a long time. This place has always been home. Now there is a subspecies within the from here called the born here. And most everyone who is a from here is also a born here, but here is the exception. Sometimes, when two young from here's get married, they have to move somewhere else for work for a while. While they are away, they may have a first or even a second child while living as expatriates in some other place. Yet when they come home, no grudge is held against them by the rest of the born here's, and they christen that child as a from here all along. They belong. <coughs> Now, I myself am currently in the probation period of what is called to come here. And according to a gruff prophet by the name of Geraldine, if I fail, I shall be cast off the Downing Bridge into the Rappahannock River with my only hope that some lesser tribe on the western banks of the river rescue me before I'm taken into the Chesapeake Bay. Now, the come here's also have a subspecies. And this also is usually within a married couple. Sometimes a from here marries a come here. And whenever there is any sort of marital spat that takes place between a from here and a come here, the come here will begin referring to themselves as a stuck here. <laughs> I'm stuck here because of you. Now I realize, uh, after having lived here 15 years, if I uh, were to live here until I was 133 years old, that means I'd live here 100 years, uh, I still would always be a come here. But I also know this, I would never ever be a stuck here because this place is majestic, it's beautiful. And more important than that, it is populated by kind, generous, and good-humored souls. And just enough of you are quirky enough to keep me interested. <laughs> now, I am, of course, most familiar in the northern neck with this church family, the people who worship here at Minokin. And while we are a hodgepodge, a collection of from here's, and come here's, there is obviously a much more unified and united vision that binds us all together. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the Holy Spirit who continues to shed light upon and illuminate these ancient words of scripture to show us and instruct us in the way of following Jesus and the way to be church in the right way in the loving way, 
and the way full of grace and forgiveness. There's one church that St. Paul founded that had struggled. And we have two letters that Paul wrote to this church. One is a scathing rebuke for some of their behavior, and that's the one that gets most of the attention. Today I want to read, hopefully with you, from this second letter. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. In this holy scripture, listen for God's word to you. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, and therefore all have died, and he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. And so we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake, He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's talk for just a moment about this church at Corinth. As I alluded to just a moment ago, this was a church with a lot of problems. Uh, Paul had gone there on one of his missionary journeys And he found people who were receptive to the message of Jesus. And so, as was often the case, a house church was begun here in Corinth. Paul stayed with them about 18 months before moving on. And even though they had gotten off to a good start, things quickly fell apart after Paul had left. There was a tattletale in that church. Every church needs a tattletale. And her name was Chloe. And Chloe saw what was going on, and she reported back to Paul, everything is a mess. You've got to address what's going on here. And certainly it it was a mess. That first letter to this church in Corinth is 16 chapters long. It's a a big letter. And basically for the first 12 of the 16 chapters, Paul is rebuking them. He's scolding them with this scathing lecture about how they have moved away from the humility of Christ. And now they've all blown themselves up in arrogance. And he points out specifically that there is a division within their church. You see, some of them had grown up within Judaism that had been their faith. And they had expected some sort of Messiah to come along. And and so, yes, they knew the story beginning with Father Abraham and going to the lawgiver Moses and the great King David and the golden age of their people and then the prophets. And now they were waiting. This was the next logical step when Paul preached Jesus to them as Messiah. These Jewish people said, yes, yes. This is what we were expecting. This is the one we were waiting on. And then there were others called Gentile Christians. Maybe they had heard of Judaism before, but maybe they hadn't heard of this other faith. And when Paul came preaching the gospel of Jesus, he said nothing about having to have that Jewish background. And so these Greeks, these Gentiles, they readily accepted the message, not so much of a Jewish Messiah, but Jesus as the Savior of the world. And initially, the love of Christ was so great between these two groups that it worked. They were unified. They were united because the gospel of Jesus and his message of love was more important than the differences of their stories. And then Paul left. And then all of a sudden, things in that church got competitive. 
Those Jewish Christians thought, well, it was really our story to begin with, so we should be the ones in charge. We should be the ones making all of the decisions. And the Gentile Christians, they're upset by this, and they say, well, we know things too from our own stories, and this should be part of it. And scandal broke out within the church. Church members stealing from one another. One young man in the church was having an affair with his own stepmother. That's 1 Corinthians 6 if you want to read the gossip column today. <laughs> Suing each other in court, which was strictly prohibited according to Paul, being part of the family of faith. And then in the actual worship service, if they felt someone from the other side was talking too much and getting too much attention, they would interrupt the worship service to say, well, what about me and what about our side? Everything had seemed to be falling apart. And because all that stuff is spicy, that's tabloid stuff. Most of us had heard this about Corinth before. We know some of those stories. Sadly, what has happened is that I think we forget the second part of the story. It appears that most of these Corinthian Christians when they received Paul's rebuke, which, by the way, part of it is he tells them, you better shape up or when I come and visit you, I'm bringing a Louisville slugger. Now, the Greek actually says a stick, but a baseball bat sounds better. And they did. They listened, as far as we know. Because when Paul writes this second letter, it is full of kindness. It is full of compassion that they have responded to the correction that he gave them, and now they are growing again in the ways of Christ, in the ways of love, and yet simultaneously, they're suffering persecution in difficult times because of their faith in Christ. So 2 Corinthians, this second letter, opens up with Paul stressing to them that God is a God of comfort and a God of consolation. And that even when it feels like God is far away, that God is near. And Paul begins to unpack for his readers some of the deeper, some of the more mature, some of the wiser teachings that come from following Jesus Christ. Notice that I begin with verse 14, although most preachers will begin with verse 16 of this passage. And the reason I did that was because everything in context matters. Notice how Paul's first proclamation in this part of the letter is to proclaim the universal salvation of humankind through what Christ has done. Not that some people belong because they make a right decision and other people don't belong because they made a wrong decision, but Christ's decision for all of us is preeminent. That Christ has rendered redemption and salvation for everyone by what he has done on the cross and by what God the Father did on the third day by raising his slain son from the dead. And so if this kind of love is the final word over all of our stories, and Paul believes it is, I believe it is, then it means there is a bigger picture that we belong to. And every single one of us, and most certainly I include myself in this, the things that go on in our daily lives so distract us and take us away from this bigger picture that we find ourselves falling back into ruts and even being threatened by the valley of the shadow of death and some of life's most dire circumstances. But Paul writes to them, wait, wait, wait. You need to realize that with what Jesus Christ has done on the cross and his new life that has emerged from that now empty tomb, that there is a whole new creation for us to look upon. Now, I know some translations say if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation or she is a new creation. That's not the best translation. It's actually quite clear. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, not just he or she is a new creation. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, there is a new creation. Everything has become new. We look at everything with different eyes. Sometimes I worry that we may have grown up thinking, I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. That means when I die, I get to go to heaven. And we think that's all there is to it. And if we stay in that place, 
It's like staying in kindergarten for your entire career of school. Paul is giving these Christians in Corinth who had repented and come back to the love of Christ a bigger message. That this gospel can become a lens through which we view everything and can see everyone and everything new because of what Christ has done. And I know sometimes the darkness threatens to overwhelm us. We have wayward children who can break our hearts. We suffer through a divorce. We have a mountain of debt and we have no idea how we're going to get through it. After 50 or 60 years with a husband or a wife, they're gone in this new reality of being a widower or widow seems like too much on some days. Despair, confusion, and anger can threaten to overwhelm us, and, and that glass, that lens, it becomes foggy, and everything is blurry, and sometimes the glass even seems to crack and break, and we're almost blind. But Paul's words in Jesus' gospel are calling us back again to this faith, to this gospel that never disappoints no matter what it may be that threatens us. I normally don't quote the same poet two times in a week. I quoted Robert Frost last week. Uh, I took the path less traveled by. That was last week. Frost also, also wrote these well-known words. Home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. I hope Minokin is a place, is a home full of people that when you need us and when you have to go there, we love to take you in. Back in May, I made my annual pilgrimage to Texas to check in on mom and dad, my own aging parents. I hope we're not recording this, Mom. I'm sorry if you're... <laughs> Actually, Dad, I'm sorry. Mom admits she's aging. <laughs> they live in Abilene, Texas, way out in West Texas. And many of you know I took a little detour this time. I spent most of my time in Texas split over uh, two different eras of my life in Waco, Texas. Uh, six years as a child, Waco was home for me. And we left there when I was 15, and then at 25, I moved back by myself and spent another eight years in Waco. And so Waco was the closest thing I ever knew to home. Even though mom and dad live in Abilene, Texas, I did my last three years of high school there, and, and, and that's it. And plus, it's ugly, and I just, it's not a place I've ever called home. I stopped in Waco for two days on this last trip. Not merely for the sake of nostalgia, which is what it was. I went and took a photograph of my favorite childhood home. I took a photograph of the last church my dad had pastored before he became a hospital chaplain. I took a photograph of Tidwell Bible Building on Baylor's campus, where it still blows my mind that I began there as a student in my last four years, was as an adjunct professor of religion, theology, and Bible in that same building. I visited the church I pastored there in Waco before I moved here and saw people that I love and will always love. But Waco's not on the way to Abilene. It's out of the way. And part of me knew this is probably the last trip. For you see, I have lived in your parsonage for well over twice as long as I've ever lived under any roof in my life. I have worshiped and fellowship with this church family exactly twice as long as any church family in my life. Now, I don't think I can ever call the Northern Neck home because it feels like something you had to have earned or been one of those from here or born here. But I have no doubt that Minokin is my home. And I call it my home proudly. May we be committed to the unity, the compassion, the love that we know simply through the gospel of Jesus. Because whether we be a from here or whether we be a come here, 
we are the people who take here with us when we go into this community and when we go into this world. Amen.